China's birth rate hit a record low in 2023, and that's contributed to the country's overall demographic problems. But why are birth rates falling? Well, my guest today is Leita Hong Fincher. She's the author of Leftover Women, The Resurgence of Gender Inequality in China. Leita, thanks for joining us. Uh, I want to begin with a very general question. I'd ask you to try and keep it as short as possible, as we'll get into the, into the details in just a moment. And the question is, what is making having children less desirable for Chinese women and families? Well, um, this is a trend that has been going on for about the past decade. Um, in 2013, actually, marriage rates hit a peak in China. And marriage rates have been falling consecutively ever since then. And then birth rates have been falling for seven consecutive years. Um, a decade ago, when I was doing my research, actually, for the first edition of my book, Left Ever Women, um, a lot of the women that I interviewed felt that they were quite unhappy in their relationships, um, but they planned to marry anyway, because the expectation was that they had to get married. Um, and we can talk a little bit about what all of those marriage pressures are. Um, those pressures still exist today, but what you're really seeing is so many more young women, especially those who have gone to college and are better educated, are realizing that they don't have to marry if they don't want to. They have more choice in their personal lives. And, uh, and a lot of these women are just uh, don't find the prospect of babies uh, as appealing as they used to. All right. We'll have more questions in just a moment. First, let's take a quick look at the background to this story. Now, last year, the UN estimated that China, long the most populous nation in the world, dropped behind India after its population fell for the first time in decades. Now, Beijing revealed this week that the numbers fell again last year, and much more seriously, by some 2 million people. Now, that puts China's population at just over 1.4 billion people. Now, one important aspect of this trend, China's birth rate, slipping to just 1.09 children per woman, uh, per woman rather, and that's one of the lowest in the world right now. Now, now we're seeing that a country that famously sought to restrain population growth through its one-child policy uh, seems to be facing the opposite problem. And of course, that's ultimately a problem when there aren't enough future workers to support the next generation of retirees. Let's go back to Leita Hong Fencher. She's the author of Leftover Women. Uh, Leita, you sort of touched on this, uh, and it makes sense to me that really uh, an increasingly educated population, women would see other priorities than just having a family. But the title of your book and what you were just saying about equality, it seems that there's more to this than just that. Is that fair to say? Yeah, well, it's a complex phenomenon. Um, yeah, the subtitle of my book is The Resurgence of Gender Inequality in China. And you see uh, in so many different facets of life, uh, for example, you see uh, falling female labor force participation rates over the last few decades, a widening gender income gap, very widespread gender discrimination in employment, hiring and, uh, and promotion, um, and also an epidemic of violence against women that fight of um, laws, new laws on, on paper in China with an anti-domestic violence law. Um, domestic violence is basically completely unpunished in China. Another important development is that in the last few years, it has become a lot more difficult for women to get divorced. Um, there was a so-called divorce cooling off period that was introduced by the government in 2021. And so um, increasingly millions more uh, women, young women in their 20s or early 30s, uh, do not see marriage as an attractive option at all. And uh, they also don't want to have even one child, let alone three. Of course, the, the, the government introduced a called three-child policy in 2021 as well. Uh, how, how is this unequal treatment of women any different than generations past in China? Well, this is quite interesting with China's uh, communist history history because one of Mao Zedong's most famous, of course, now is the founder of the People's Republic, um, was that 
women hold up half the sky. And in the early communist era, the Communist Party assigned women jobs en masse. And in fact, they had a widespread propaganda campaign um, all up until the end of the 1970s, urging women to marry and have children later. Um, but then uh, around that time, the government also was carrying out this draconian population planning policy, often referred to as one child policy, um, where there were so many egregious uh, abuses of women's rights, things like forced sterilizations, mass forcible insertion of IUDs. Um, but uh, since the onset of market reforms in particular, this is a long standing process. There have been um, a, a lot of different ways in which gender, traditional gender inequality from from China's history has has returned in many different ways. Um, and at the same time, women today are better educated than ever before in Chinese history. Um, and this should be something to be celebrated, actually. But the government doesn't see educated women as uh, a great thing. They actually see that development as, as a threat to political stability in many ways. Um, and just recently, Xi Jinping said that uh, effectively that uh, women need to return to the home, return to these very beautiful roles of wife and mother to preserve harmony in the family, and that that would contribute to a political harmony or political stability for the entire country. You've spoken before about how the term leftover women itself was this kind of government propaganda to describe unmarried women of child rearing age. You know, we talk about women today in China being so much more educated uh, than they were in the past. I, I would imagine that such labels are still incredibly powerful in a place like China. How difficult has it been for women to defy that kind of term? Yes. Well, uh, leftover women was actually defined by the Chinese government in 2007 to mean a woman who is 27 years old, um, educated and single. And I, I write about this a lot in my book, um, was a massive propaganda campaign to insult women like this who are single and educated, um, warn them that they don't hurry up and marry and have a baby well, when, when the uh, propaganda came out, it was still under the one-child policy um, that, that the, if these women don't hurry up and marry and have babies, that no man will ever want them and they'll be miserable for the rest of their lives. Um, the thing is, the, the propaganda was quite effective initially when it came out in 2007, but uh, over the last decade, that propaganda no longer works. It is completely failing. Um, so you still see very intense pressure on women to marry, um, and there is even more pressure from the government now for them to have three babies instead of one baby. But um, but that kind of you just see millions and millions more women who are saying no to pressure. That takes a lot of courage, by the way, because some of the most difficult, intense pressure to marry and the baby comes from the women's own parents um, who are also being pressured by the government and, and government propaganda. So it is difficult to push back, but this is what we're seeing on a massive scale is that millions more young women uh, are much more aware of widespread sexism in society. Um, feminism has become a lot more mainstream in society. Um, and so you increasingly have women just realizing that they can stand up, say no to that pressure um, in spite of how difficult it is. We have a few sound bites from young Chinese women and men. Uh, let's take a moment to hear in their words why having children is uh, problematic or difficult right now. Now many of my friends are dinkies, you know, dual income, no kids, including those in my company who are younger than me. All say that they don't want children. They say they're still young. And then there's the financial pressure. If you have a kid, you have to pay for schooling. 
I think for me, having children would be difficult because of all the practical concerns you have to consider. I have my own pet, so I think it's more appropriate for me to have a pet than a child. I think most young people today are fairly rational, and they take into consideration all the costs of childcare. All right, back to Leita Hong Fincher. She's author of Leftover Women. Um, you know, the pet guy is interesting. Maybe we'll get back to him in a moment. But I want to talk about costs. We heard two women there talking about costs as being a real prohibitive factor. What kind of expenses do Chinese women and couples face when it comes to raising children? And are they really so significant compared to other societies? Yes. Um, there's no question that a lot of young people, um, you know, they're women or men or whatever, non-binary, you know, uh, the cost of living is very expensive. One of the things that I write about since that is quite complex is um, the widespread expectation that young couples, when they marry, are supposed to purchase a home. And so... Um, there's the cost of housing, the cost of um, educating your children, uh, medical care. The thing is, though, that the cost of living has been a big concern for much more than a decade. I mean, I would say at least 20 years um, that this has been an inhibiting factor for anybody who wants to have a child. The key difference really over the last decade, five to ten years, um, is not just how expensive it is to have a child or more. Um, it's really women, it's really young women in particular who are averse to getting married and uh, being trapped in this role of uh, wife and mother, uh, not being able to do their careers. I mean, they, so that there are a lot of other factors beyond just the high cost of living and the high cost of housing. Do we see any efforts from Beijing to acknowledge this, to try and ease some of those concerns, whether it is cost or whether it is inequality, of course, a much uh, a broader issue? Yes. I mean, the government has introduced some incentives to try to push or persuade uh, young people into marrying and having children at a young age. In fact, Xi Jinping just said a few months ago that China has to embrace a new marriage and child rearing culture uh, where people marry at, quote unquote, an, an appropriate age. Uh, but, but a lot of those incentives are um, actually kind of implicit threats. To give you an example, there's one county that offered a 1,000 renminbi reward, uh, just over 100 US dollars, uh, and a reward to newlywed couples if the bride is 25 years old or younger. I mean, that first of all, that that's a laughably small amount of money. Those kinds of incentives are not going to change young people's minds about marrying um, or, or having babies. And as for addressing widespread gender inequality, I mean, that is really coming directly from uh, the highest levels of the Chinese government. I mean, um, Xi Jinping himself is saying, uh, he's no longer saying things about how gender equality is, um, is one of the most important principles for the Communist Party. He is explicitly saying that women need to return to the home. Uh, government not doing anything substantive, in my view, to address falling rates of female labor force participation or widespread gender discrimination by employers. I mean, you, you see routinely employers, when they're interviewing uh, women, especially in their 20s and early 30s, routinely asking them, when are you getting married? When are you having your first baby? When are you having your second baby? Um, things like that that are actually even illegal in China, but it's still widespread practice. And so this is, um, this, this is one indication that the Chinese government no longer sees economic growth as its number one priority after Xi Jinping. Basically, the number one priority is to maintain 
of Communist Party longevity to maintain political stability. And it's rather complex. I write about it in my book, but um, but I make the argument that, um, especially under Xi Jinping, uh, that, that that the Communist Party sees the subjugation of women, um, reducing women to the role of subservient wife and mother in the home, is seen as something that helps preserve political stability. Um, one of the ways in which it does that is to make uh, make it basically um, very difficult to, to penalize men who are violent towards women in their own homes. The government just turns a blind eye to that kind of violence. It, it, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but to what extent does the one-child policy and its legacy um, leave a burden on this current generation as they, they hit this child-rearing age? Well, I mean, there's no question that uh, the fact that this one-child policy uh, that resulted in just terrible abuses of human rights for many years, over three decades, uh, well over three decades, a very draconian enforcement methods that caused widespread suffering, um, that the government can't suddenly just abandon that and then all of a sudden uh, say, okay, everybody gets to or please have three babies. I mean, those women who were forcibly sterilized or had IUDs forcibly inserted. Some some of them were subjected to forced abortions. Those women are not dead. I mean, they're not even that old, in fact. Um, so it, it is part of the lived experience of all of these um, people. Um, and, and women in particular, they're the ones who are bearing the brunt, of course, of uh, widespread gender discrimination. They're the ones who have to have the babies. Um, they, even if their own parents are telling them, in many cases they are, saying, you know, you really have to marry, you've got to have at least one baby. Um, I mean, a, a lot of the, the daughter member as well, they could see how much their own mothers maybe suffered, um, and they don't want to oppose that. And also, of course, the daughters today are, are um, generally speaking, much better educated than um, than their parents. I mean, they're better educated. And so they want more options for themselves. Um, they, you know, they, they want to pursue their dreams. Where does this go from here? Um, when we look especially at China, its economic situation, many think that it's entering perhaps a prolonged stagnation. Um, and if the government's not willing to make the situation better in terms of working with women um, instead of, you know, appealing to patriotic duty, do we have any sense of, of when something gives or, or what direction this could take? Well, I mean, unfortunately, this does not paint a very bright picture for the future of women's rights in particular in the country. Um, I mean, I, I don't, I hesitate to lay out what the bleakest scenario would be, but uh, you, you're already seeing restrictions on um, things like widespread restrictions on vasectomies. Um, so I think that it's we can probably expect more restrictions on abortion um, for sure. The fact that the government hasn't actually come out and really drastically reduced with us access to abortion yet shows you that even Xi Jinping is aware that you can't just uh, go in and force women to get married and force them to have babies, that that would result in a massive uh, rebellion. Um, and, and I might add that this is a political challenge for sure, as well as an economic challenge. I mean, these reduced birth rates are basically baked in to the demographic picture for the next entire generation. Yeah. This, this is going to be the picture for the next several decades. You can't, even if the government were to suddenly change, they did everything and offer free childcare, you know, free um, 
education for all children, free medical care, free elder care, to make the lives of women in particular easier, even if it were to do that. You know, the demographic situation is already there. They're not going to be able to significantly boost birth rates. Um, so this is, uh, this is pretty grim for the future. A another thing, of course, is that the government could boost immigration um, to, to allow workers from other countries to come and work in China. But again, we get on into the issue of political stability, mm. where uh, I don't see any indication that that's on the table. All right, we'll have to leave it there for now. I want to thank our guest, Leita Hong Fincher. She's author of Leftover Women, The Resurgence of Gender Inequality in China. Leita, thank you. We also want to thank, thank you, you, our viewers, for watching. There's plenty more here on the DW News YouTube channel, and we hope to see you again soon. Take care.